hearing me? Somewhat? It is on now, at least. Is it like this? Okay. All right, let me test again. If I'm, am I audible? I see some nodding, but it's not very convincing. Am I audible now? All right, great. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have to warn you before I start, I, uh, I woke up at four this morning in order to be here on time, so I feel uh, sort of hungover, but without the drinking. Uh, but so yeah, if I, if I don't seem very sharp to you, then let's, let's blame it on that. And I have to keep track of a lot of logistics. Apparently I have to adjust the camera while I, while I do this, so I, I'll try to do that correctly. I'm gonna start over here. Okay, so um, let me just very quickly uh, outline the plan for these three lectures, but uh, only very roughly. Uh, so the first, so today, uh, I want to sort of do a review of rational homotopy theory, um, which of course I'm hoping you're all intimately familiar with, and uh, I'll do a bit of uh, intro to uh, periodic homotopy theory, but only in a sketchy way. Uh, then tomorrow, um, I want to uh, delve into uh, Kazoo duality. So I want to talk about Kazoo duality for well, operats and algebras for operats uh, in a rather uh, general setup. Um, and in particular, I want to uh, discuss uh, the notion of a, of a spectral Lie algebra. Okay, so these are some version of the theory of Lie algebras that, that is adapted to stable homotopy theory. Um, and and well, Kuzu duality is a, is a convenient way to, to set this up or to explain what they are. Is the writing big enough, by the way? It's a big room. Yeah? Um, and then the third one, so that's on Wednesday, uh, I want to uh, get into uh, the specifics of um, VN periodic uh, unstable homotopy theory. Okay. Right, so let's, uh, let's get started and let's just uh, dive into rational homotopy theory. So um, I'll do a very, very brief historical survey. So uh, any story on rational homotopy theory should start with uh, Sarah's work uh, on rational homotopy groups. He was the first one to really do anything here. Um, so this was in, in 53, I believe. So Sayer uh, did many things in 53, but he also computed the rational homotopy groups of spheres. So uh, as a result, of course, there's the following, that if you look at an odd dimensional sphere, uh, and you look at the homotopy groups of that sphere, then, well, those are finitely generated abelian groups. It's another thing he proved. And then if you tensor them with Q, then you get the, the simplest possible answer, okay? So this looks like uh, Q in dimension N and uh, zero otherwise. Okay, so rationally, an odd sphere is just an eilenberg maclane space. Uh, for even spheres, that's not quite the case, uh, but the answer is not so far off. Uh, if you look at an even dimension, then the answer is the following. Um, so rational homotopy groups of an even sphere are given by Q, again, in dimension N. So that's the the thing you'd expect, and then there's one other Q which sits in dimension 2n minus 1. And it's zero otherwise. Okay? So there's sort of one funny element, or one funny class popping up, and one explicit way to describe that class is by saying it's, it's the whitehead bracket, or the self bracket of the, the fundamental class of Sn. So this, uh, this extra class in uh, degree or dimension k is 4n minus 1 uh, is given by the, uh, the whitehead bracket. Uh, so the whitehead bracket uh, of, uh, let me denote it like this, I'll write it as the bracket of iota n 
with itself, where iota n is just the notation for the, the fundamental class of Sn. Right, so let me maybe just give a very brief uh, recollection on what the whitehead bracket actually is, because I'll, uh, in some sense, I'll use it a lot, maybe not very explicitly, but um, it's, it's just, right, the, the whitehead bracket is a Lie bracket that is defined on the, on the homotopy groups of any pointed space. Right, so if x uh, is a pointed space, and I have classes, let's say alpha, in pi k plus one of x, and I have another class, beta, in uh, well, some other dimension, pi l plus one of x, then their bracket, or their whitehead bracket, is defined in the following way. Um, well, it's a class well, denoted by a bracket. It lives in dimension pi k plus l plus one of x. Um, and it's given by the following composite of maps. Um, yeah, okay, I'll move up this board in a minute. Um, what, you, what you do is um, alpha and beta together define a map from the, the wedge of these two spheres into x. So this is just alpha, beta. And now I can pre-compose this with a certain map from S k plus L plus one. So this sort of the universal whitehead bracket. And what is it? It's just the it's the attaching map of the top cell in the in the product of the two spheres. Right, so this here seems like a good time to switch. Okay, so this is the attaching map of the top cell um, in the product of these two spheres. All right. So that's something you can do for the homotopy groups of any space. Now I have to switch screens. Oh, yeah, there is. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, N was 2N in my head. Does this fix your confusion? No. No, I, I took these classes in K plus 1. So you take K and L to both be N minus 1, and then you can work out the numbers from there. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I should repeat questions, I guess. The question is, if I say that this bracket is a Lie bracket, do I mean a, a graded Lie bracket? So I assume the question means, do you have to take signs into account? And the answer to that is yes. Yeah. I was going to write that down, actually. So I'll still do that. Okay. So the fact is that this, this whitehead bracket um, makes uh, the collection of homotopy groups, or rather this shifted collection of homotopy groups. So this. Um, makes pi star plus one of x uh, into a graded Lie algebra. Right, so that means that the usual two axioms for a Lie algebra hold, namely anti-symmetry and the Jacobi identity, but you have to put in the appropriate Kazool signs everywhere. Okay. Um, oh yeah, I can't move this. Right. Um, so, okay, so uh, looking at it like this, there is this sort of a, a reformulation of, of Serre's calculation, which is suggestive, so I want to uh, make it explicit. So you can, you can sort of reformulate Serre's result as follows. You could say uh, the rational homotopy groups of a sphere are just uh, the, the free object on the, on the fundamental class. So these are the free so this is the free graded Lie algebra. Uh, on this fundamental class iota n, which right, lives in pi n, Sn. OK, 
Okay, so why is that true? I mean, in one of the two cases, like when n is odd, so I'm shifting the homotopy group, so secretly then, if I'm thinking of this Lie algebra, that, that odd fundamental class will live in an even degree. Um, the self bracket is just zero for degree reasons, or sorry, for the anti-symmetry um, reasons, because that axiom. So if you take the free Lie algebra on one element, like you're, as you would usually think, that's just that one element and nothing else. There's no self bracket, so. And that's what the rational homotopy groups of an odd sphere look like. There's just the fundamental class, and that's it. If you're uh, looking at the free graded Lie algebra on an odd dimensional class, so that corresponds to n is even on that board, then there's no reason for the self bracket to be zero because anti-symmetry isn't telling you anything in that case. Um, so that's still there, and that's this this extra class in, in dimension two n minus one. Um, but then it stops. So if you look at the, you can look at further self brackets, but the Jacobi identity will tell you that those have to be zero, as you can check. Okay. Right. So this already suggests that Lie algebras play a very fundamental role here, and of course they they do, and that the the real articulation of that comes in. Uh, Quillen's work on rational homotopy theory, so I'll quickly move on to uh, to that. Um, right. I feel awkward writing here. I'm going to move down below the desk pretty quickly, or is that not such a big problem? Let's. I'm, I'm just going to... Okay. I'll do a few more lines, and then we'll switch the boards. Sorry? Two lines. Okay. Well, we'll do two lines. That should work. Uh, this is the wrong set of notes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Right, so uh, let me just quickly um, describe the, the, the setup of, of rational homotopy theory a la Quillen. So to talk a bit about the, the category of rational spaces. So let me just introduce some, some notation and some terminology. So um, a, okay, uh, this is bad. I'm going to work on the other board. Sorry. Um, I just stop it? Oh, yeah. I think I uh, I figured it out. Great. Um, okay. Uh, right. So um, a simply connected space X, a pointed space. I should have inserted that. X, and I'll, I'll use the following notation for the the category or the infinity category of, well, this will be for pointed spaces, so S star means pointed spaces for me, and then simply connected, I'll indicate by saying starts in dimension two, like this. Um, so such a space is called rational, uh, precisely if its homotopy groups are rational, right? So if uh, pi and x uh, is a rational vector space, for each n. Right, being a rational vector space is a property of the abelian group, not a structure. Um, and I want to also introduce the notion of rational equivalence. I'll need that. So a map uh, f between two pointed spaces. So a map in in this category of simply connected pointed spaces is called a rational equivalence. Well, simply if it induces an isomorphism on rational homotopy groups, right? So if I take pi star of f tensor q, this is an iso. Isomorphism. Okay, so there are basically there are sort of two ways of thinking about rational homotopy theory. You could say it's whatever you get from homotopy theory by inverting the rational equivalences, or you could say it's the homotopy theory of rational spaces, and those two perspectives uh, mean the same thing, essentially for the, for the following reason. Uh, there's always an optimal way to approximate any space by a rational space, right? So any space, any pointed simply connected space, so any x in here uh, admits uh, what's called a rationalization It's a rationalization that's it's a map. I'll denote it like this. I'll call it eta. 
map from x to some other pointed space xq such that the following two things hold true. Um, first of all, this xq is a rational space. And um, this map eta is a, is a rational equivalence. Um, so a, a consequence of this is that uh, my board work is really very inefficient here. I'll, tr I'll try to do better. Um, a consequence of this is that the, well, the localization in the categorical sense of this category simply connected spaces that the rational equivalences exists, right? So consequence is that there is uh, uh, a left adjoint to the inclusion. So if you look at, oh, I didn't introduce this notation. I should have, sorry. So this is my notation for rational spaces. So you can still add it here. So this the full subcategory on the rational spaces. I'll, I'll just denote like this. OK, so this inclusion. this infinity category into all pointed, simply connected spaces uh, admits a left adjoint, uh, which I'll call LQ. And this LQ really uh, exhibits this category or this infinity category as the localization of this guy at the rational equivalences. So it's exhibiting um, this as the localization star at the rational equivalences. Right, so what does that mean, the localization? It just means th that this LQ is the universal functor that inverts rational equivalences. So any functor out of here that sends rational equivalences to isomorphisms must factor over this LQ. That's what it means uniquely. All right, so uh, from this point of view, the, the object of rational homotopy theory is to study this infinity category. You want to get structural results for this, for this thing, and that's precisely what Quillen did, and he really proved a very uh, remarkable uh, result. Namely, he provided a, a completely algebraic description of this category, which, well, especially at the time, but I think still, I mean, this is surprising because, you know, homotopy theory is supposed to be quite a flabby thing. So Quillen, he uh, established the following. There are equivalences of infinity categories uh, as follows. So it's rational, simply connected spaces. And then there are two different ways to um, well, make this algebraic. So one of them is uh, in terms of differential graded Lie algebras. So he proved that there is a, uh, an equivalence of infinity categories to something I'll denote like this. So the notation here means uh, these are connected differential graded Lie algebras over the rational numbers, clearly. Um, and let me label this functor LQ. Oh, I shouldn't call this LQ. Oh, man. Okay. Um, yeah. Great preparation. Let's call it Lee. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, what's the next letter in the alphabet? This is M, okay? All right. Um, the other one uh, I will call uh, CQ didn't use that yet. That's for, for rational chains. So this is going to land in uh, commutative co-algebras. So uh, that's, well, so this is the notation for commutative co-algebras. And again, these are supposed to be in 
chain complexes over Q, so I guess I really mean DG coalgebras, and I also, to be precise, should demand that these are augmented. Okay, maybe the correct term would be co-augmented, and then uh, they should also be simply connected. Okay, I'll, I'll stop writing the adjectives. I hope that's clear by now. Um, what the interaction is? There is an interaction. Yeah, there is some kind of Leibniz rule for the differential with respect to the bracket. Yeah, yeah. So there is an interaction. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, sure. I did. Like, it makes sense to speak of Lie algebras in, in any reasonable symmetric monoidal additive category. And if I apply that definition to this particular one, namely chain complexes over Q, then you'll see that it automatically enforces uh, a Leibniz rule. But, uh, okay. Um, and the same here, right? I mean, this is, this is dual to, you know, CDGAs as you're used to them, and those also have a Leibniz rule. So that, that's also baked in to that uh, definition. Are there other questions? Sorry. Wait, sorry. Is the question why coalgebras or? Well, so it's, yeah, let me, okay, let me try to answer that. So the question is why, why these, like, I mean, as you've already observed, this is some refinement of the homology. I'm really taking the actual chains rather than the homology. And the reason is not really Steenrod operations because rationally there aren't any Steenrod operations. Those are very much a P primary thing. Um, but I still have to really keep track of the, the, the multiplicative structure, like, or the co-multiplicative structure. So what I'm remembering under this functor, and I will we'll also get to that, pretty soon, but I'm, I'm still remembering the, the co-multiplication that comes from the diagonal map of a space, yeah, which is the dual of the, the, I mean, if you dualize everything, it becomes the cup product on co-chains, which may be more familiar. Um, right, but one of the reasons that rational homotopy theory works as well as it does is exactly because there aren't any steamrod operations. Like, those would make your life considerably harder. Um, as you can, for example, see in Mandel's piatic homotopy theory, like, you really have to keep track of track of them. Um, uh, what did I want to say about this result? I guess quite a few things. Let me make sure not to miss out on any of them. Um, right, so I'd, I want to list uh, a, a few properties of, of this. Right, and right now it's maybe, if, 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 yeah, if you know this result, fine. If you don't, then maybe it seems like it's coming out of the blue. Um, so let me just... Uh, make a few remarks about this. So first, this, this functor that I, that I wanted to label LQ but didn't, so this, this M, you should really think of this as uh, an enhancement of the, uh, of the rational homotopy groups of a space. So this, so this sort of enhances or refines is maybe a better term, but now I wrote this, uh, the rational homotopy groups um, in the following sense. Well, if I, if I look at this M applied to a, a space X, a rational space X, then, well, it's a DG Lie algebra, but in particular, it's a chain complex. So I could take its homology, and uh, so the underlying, so the homology of this underlying chain complex is exactly, well, the collection of rational homotopy groups of X, but shifted by one. That's also where this degree shift is coming from. And, um, well, the, the brackets agree. So in the sense that, well, this comes from a Lie algebra, so it's, it's homology. It carries a Lie algebra structure. And the Lie algebra structure here agrees with this whitehead bracket that I just introduced on this side. Okay, so the Lie bracket corresponds to the whitehead bracket. Okay. Um, so this, the left side, the left equivalence is very closely related to homotopy groups. The, the right-hand side is much more closely related to homology, as we were just uh, talking about. So this, this CQ here, this is really, uh, let me say is, maybe in quotation marks, this is the rational chains functor. Um, so this is really, uh, you take, 
rational chains on X with values in Q. And now, whether you like the sentence or not depends on like what kinds of models you want to work with. Like when Quillen was writing his paper, you know, he couldn't he couldn't say it like this because they were working with actual you know on the nose models for chains, and this isn't really a symmetric monoidal functor, and blah blah blah. Um, but it's it's really instructive to go back and read Quillen's paper. So not only because well, Quillen's a very good mathematician, so it's it's interesting to read, but also to sort of appreciate how far uh, technology has advanced. Like he. He clearly had the, the, the all of the fundamental insights, but he had to work really, really hard to to prove it all and put it all together. And the main, well, there were just lots of technical difficulties. So you had to pass through all sorts of intermediate categories to set this up, just because the sort of the, the convenient models for certain functors weren't available. But nowadays, you, you can make this easy for yourself. You can take something like uh, sigma infinity plus x tensor hq. Uh, in the infinity category of HQ modules or something like that. Like these are symmetric monoidal functors, so this would send coalgebras to coalgebras, and then HQ modules is, as an infinity category, it's equivalent to chain complexes over Q, so it would be one way to, to get your functor. That I, I should have said, I should have written. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, with, yes, with the correct model structure, yes. But, um, that, uh, yeah, but it, it's a bit deceptive because so over Q these things tend to work reasonably well, and then if you move away from Q, you yeah, it's uh, it's horrible. So um, yeah, but coal I mean Quillen uh, he has DG coalgebras in his paper like they're there already, um, um, which is often somehow forgotten. I th like often when people present this result, they say oh the left hand side is the Quillen side and the right hand side after you dualize is the Sullivan side or something that. I don't think that's quite how it works because th this, like this abstract result, is proved by Quillen, and then Sullivan. He did a really great thing. He wrote down an actual functor from simplicial sets to to CDGAs that you can just compute with, and develop the theory of minimal models. And those are both major contributions. But that's that, that's something else than saying that the right hand side is the Sullivan. Anyway, uh, uh, end of this of this pet peeve. Um, so th I still wanted to say one thing. So the 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 coalgebra structure here. comes from so the, the most obvious coalgebra structure that exists on any space, which is the diagonal map. OK. All right. So in particular, if you take the homology groups of the underlying chain complex, you get the usual homology with its usual coproduct. All right. Um, Okay, so now if you if you wanted to sort of try to prove this result from a like modern day perspective, if you wanted to prove Quillen's theorem, then I think the place to start would be you write down this functor, which nowadays is not very hard to do, and then you, you can sort of prove by brute force that this is an equivalent of infinity categories by sort of the, the you do an induction where the base case is you, you investigate Eilenberg McLean spaces, which rationally is not hard, and you see that those correspond to co free coalgebras, and then you do an induction up to Postnikov Tower and the Eilenberg Mohr spectral sequence sort of takes care of the inductive step. Um, so this is not actually very hard anymore. And then to get to the other side, to Lie algebras, then you have to do something rather interesting, uh, I think, which is Kazoo duality. So that's what I want to talk about. And I shouldn't forget to switch the camera around again. Uh, yeah, OK. Right. So these, these two algebraic models um, are sort of two sides of the same coin and well you can you can relate them in a direct fashion so you can pass on you can pass back and forth directly between uh, commutative coalgebras and and Lie algebras and that's what what's Kazoo, what Kazoo duality is is about so um, so these two infinity categories let me uh, keep track of the augmentation um, so these are in in some precise sense uh, Kazoo dual to each other, and well, as I was saying in particular, there's an algebraic way of getting from one side to the other, and um, well, actually by proving sort of directly in an algebraic fashion that these are equivalent after restricting to these subcategories, you, you, you get a proof of, uh, of Quillen's results. So what I want to do is, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll really talk in more detail about Kazoo duality. Now I want to be a bit more uh, descriptive, so I'm going to try to explain, uh, well, how to get from here to here. And then uh, I'll be a bit more uh, general and also hopefully precise uh, tomorrow. 
So in order to uh, explain this, let me let me first switch from coalgebras to just algebras because it's just psychologically easier. Other than that, it doesn't really matter. So uh, if you restrict a uh, finite type spaces, then you could also phrase uh, the right-hand side of uh, Quillen's theorem as um, you look at finite type, which just means in every dimension the, the homology groups are finitely generated or the homotopy groups are finitely generated. Um, and then um, there's an equivalence from here now to just commutative uh, DGAs still augmented. And now because we're, we're dualizing these live in homological degrees to less than or equal to minus two, I guess there's an, there's an op. And now the functor here is the, the cochain functor. So I'll use this check for taking a linear dual. So this is just the rational cochains of a space. All right. So now let me uh, try to explain um, how to get uh, from commutative algebras to Lie algebras. Um, so one way to do this is to uh, consider the following setup. So if you're looking at commutative algebras augmented in in this case, we're doing this in chain complexes over Q, but it, it doesn't really matter so much. Uh, I could put something else here. Um, there are a couple of functors that, that relate, tis, relate this uh, to just uh, the, cate the underlying category, chain complex over Q. The one I want to consider here is, uh, well, I'll write it as triv, but what I mean is, well, it's the simplest way to uh, equip uh, a chain complex with a commutative algebra structure, namely the square zero functor. So it, it takes chain complex V and it sends it to Q plus V with the square zero uh, multiplication, right? And augmentation, just the obvious projection onto Q. Um, so this functor uh, has a left adjoint. I mean, just for formal reasons, but you can also just construct that left adjoint uh, very explicitly. So this left adjoint here, uh, there are many ways to talk about it. I'll label it uh, index, so index for indecomposables. Um, but this functor might be familiar to you under uh, oh, any number of different names. So let me just list a few. So Okay, so this adjoint here just takes the, the indecomposables, or maybe I should say the derived indecomposables of an augmented uh, commutative algebra. Uh, another name for the same functor is uh, Andre Quillen homology uh, of a commutative algebra, or yet another name for the same thing is the, the cotangent fiber. Okay, because another way to sort of describe this thing is you have an augmented algebra A over Q, then you could take the cotangent complex of A and then base change it along the augmentation to Q. That's, that's one way to give a, a formula for this functor. Anyway, all these mean the same thing. Um, and, well, let me list a few properties of this, of this functor index should uh, illustrate its role. So first of all, uh, let me make the most obvious point. This index preserves co-limits, okay? I mean, it's the left adjoint, so what is there to say? Um, okay, so that's one property. The other property is um, if you compute the indecomposables of a free algebra, you just get the generators of that free algebra. So index of a free commutative algebra, chain complex V, is naturally isomorphic to V. This is something you can just check more or less directly from the definition. Um, okay. So 
what these two things tell you is that really this index it sort of it behaves as a homology theory for commutative algebras, which uh, is also indicated by this particular name for it, of course. But so this this, uh, this tells you so one tells you that index behaves like a homology theory. commutative algebras. So for example, you should really think of the property of preserving pushouts as some form of excision. Uh, and then uh, property two tells you that, well, for this homology theory, the free algebras, they sort of play the role of, uh, of cells. So uh, this property two uh, tells you that um, to compute in decomposables of A in practice, what you sort of have to do is, is understand a cell structure on A, in other words, to understand how it's built uh, from free algebras by colimits, or in particular things like pushouts and, uh, and filter colimits, for example. So to compute index A, you should understand, um, or I mean, usually the logic goes the other way. You try to compute index and then learn something about the cell structure, but okay. Um, The cell structure of A, by which I mean uh, how A is built in cells. So those are free algebras uh, via things like pushouts, but in colimits. Okay, if you have a colimit decomposition of A in terms of free algebras, then you can just use properties one and two to identify the indecomposables of that algebra. Okay, so it's similar to how for just for a CW complex, you can compute its singular homology, and that will tell you something about the cell structure of that CW complex. Okay, in fact, it's not even just a homology theory. This index is the uh, it's it's even the universal homology theory for commutative rings. So it's a theorem of Bester and Mandel, so let me just quickly state it as a remark. Um, yeah. Okay, so 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 the question is, what happens if I replace Q by F P? But y you can just do the same thing over F P. I, I, there's a there's a similar setup. I can talk about square zero algebras over H F P, say, and uh, and there is an indecomposable function in the in the other direction. That's you can do that. I mean, it will be less relevant for rational homotopy theory, maybe, but y it's the setup formally exists and is is fine. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I just I mean, it's it's not wrong. So you know, it might feel awkward. It's uh, I th it, it just depends on what you want to do with it, right? It's. Uh, it I'm not claiming that over FP this story will have the same relevance as the one that I'm, well, it will have some relevance, but it, it just depends on what you're trying to do. I, I find it hard to give a satisfactory answer because, um, but the, the, the construction is fine. You can, like, there's nothing particular about Q in what I'm saying here. And tomorrow I'll repeat part of this story, replacing chain complexes over Q by just a very general stable infinity category, and it, 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 it will still yield an interesting, well, I claim interesting setup. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that addresses your point, but we can, okay. All right, um, what did I want to say? Oh yeah, I wanted to make this remark. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I shouldn't do this, sorry. So I wanted to state that this index, it's really, it's the universal homology theory 
for commutative algebras uh, in the sense that, well, any other colimit preserving functor to something stable must factor over it. So one way to say that is that this index induces an equivalence between the stabilization of this homotopy theory here. So let me, yeah. So index induces a functor from here to here, and that functor is an equivalence. Okay. So this is this is a theorem of best error Mendel essentially. All right. Okay. So th the point I really wanted to make about these indecomposables um, is, well, I, I was trying to say something about Lie algebras, and the point is that this is the functor that that sort of implements the passage to Lie algebras. So this index of A. Um, well, this thing itself uh, does not quite carry the, the structure of a Lie algebra. You first have to take its linear dual. Okay, so you just dualize everything. This has the structure uh, of a shifted Lie algebra. This is not at all obvious from what I've said so far. I'll try to say more about this tomorrow, sort of how this structure arises or how you might think about this. Um, but that's that's sort of the key point in this um, this Kazoo duality. And it, it, it sort of this, well, let me draw a diagram. So you get an adjoint pair between the category of Lie algebras, uh, differential graded over Q, and these augmented commutative algebras op. Um, so here you have this uh, index dual, and well, to be completely precise, I do have to, again, implement this degree shift that we saw before to make everything work out. So you have to shift this down one homological degree, but uh, we'll get to that too, actually. And uh, this functor turns out to have a left adjoint again. This thing is a right adjoint. It has a left adjoint, and it, the left adjoint has a very, well, symmetric looking description. You might as well also denote, oh sorry, I'm calling this index of, it's index of blank, of course, it's a functor. Um, this has a left adjoint, which you might also just label index blank uh, uh, dual, should I, uh, yeah. So here I mean uh, in decomposables, but now in the sense of Lie algebras. The point is, I could have played a very similar game with the category of Lie algebras to any chain complex I can associate the trivial Lie algebra, which just means put the zero bracket on it, so the abelian Lie algebra. That functor will have a, an adjoint in the sense of infinity categories, and that's, that's the derived abelianization or the indecomposables of a Lie algebra. Um, and this functor actually might be uh, more familiar than the one I was describing before because it admits a very classical model. So this is really. Uh, uh, just the, the chevalier eilenberg cohomology, or the chevalier eilenberg cochain complex in disguise. Or it, that's a particular model for this functor. And, well, if you've ever used or studied chevalier eilenberg cochains, then you'll know that this is a commutative algebra. Well, it's a CDGA. So that really is, even before doing any infinity stuff, you can really write that down as a functor from differential graded Lie algebras to CDGAs. And that's that's a model for the functor that I'm talking about. Okay. So these these indecomposables are really a, a key point in, in passing back and forth uh, between uh, Lie algebras and commutative algebras, or Lie algebras and commutative co-algebras. So maybe let me just make a quick remark about that. I mean, I, I switched to commutative algebras for convenience, but it's really a bit better or more convenient to stick to the co-algebras because you don't have to introduce any finite type stuff. So it's a bit cleaner uh, to work with an adjoint pair that goes as follows. We just we don't do any of the dualization, we just stick with commutative co-algebras. Like so. And so here is this in decomposables um, shifted by one. And here, well this has to be somehow the dual construction of indecomposable, so that's usually called primitives. These are the primitives of a coalgebra shifted down by minus one. So here, 
you, you just have to dualize the construction that I did. So indecomposables was the left adjoint of taking the trivial or the square zero algebra. Primitives is, is taking the right adjoint of the trivial co-algebra, the square zero co-algebra. Okay, you just reverse all the arrows, and if you do that well enough, then this is what comes out. Okay, and one way of sort of formulating part of Quillen's result then is to say, well, there's this adjunction, and on good enough subcategories, it restricts to an equivalence. So this restricts to an equivalence uh, between the subcategories of connected Lie algebras and simply connected co-algebras. Okay, so that would be one way to well, look at the proof of Quillen's result. You first do the right-hand side using whatever method you like, and then you pass the Lie algebras using something like this. Screens. Oh, still, still have the right camera on. That's great. Okay. Um, so, uh, did I want to say any more about this? Well, I guess maybe. You know, if if the way I phrased this was a bit too abstract for you, then it's probably good to, to ground yourself by doing a little exercise. So here is one that you can do in your own time. So. You use this uh, this kind of perspective to uh, just test this on uh, on a sphere. So, you know, try computing the derived indecomposables of the cochains of uh, S two n with values in Q. Right. So, this here, right? This is just Q x mod x squared. It's equivalent to that, where x lives in in degree two n. Uh, this is uh, a commutative algebra in which it's very easy to find a cell structure with just two cells, and that will make it very easy to compute its indecomposables, and you try to use this to reproduce Sarah's calculation. Sarah's result. Okay. Is there a good reason why primitives of chains looks like homotopy groups? Uh, I mean, that, yeah, what's good, right? I mean, um, th th that's definitely something that had a precursor. I mean, I th I mean, that's surely one of the things that inspired Quillen, right? If you, there were already results of the kind, um, like who proved these? I, I, for I forget, but like for, um, Like if you look at the homology of a, of a loop, the rational homology of a loop space, then uh, that thing looks like the universal enveloping algebra of of its homotopy groups, right? It was already sort of in that case, it was it was sort of known that for 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 nice spaces, you can extract the homotopy groups as the primitives of the homology groups. Um, so this 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 yoga of yeah. So in in that case, yeah, uh, th there was a, a good. You could have. Guessed, yeah, but I mean, it's sort of, it's still, yeah, sure. I mean, like in hindsight, everything's natural, right? But uh, I, I still want to say that, you know, Quillen's stuff is really, uh, it's really something, right? It's not something that I would say was, was like in the air and he just wrote it down. It's really hard work and it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental insight. I don't want to short change uh, Quillen in these lectures. Um, um, uh, is, I don't know, was that even a, my English is deteriorating. Was that even a proper, I don't know. It doesn't matter. I think you know what I mean. Um, how much time? 15 minutes. Okay, good. So uh, this is sort of it for my ho overview of rational homotopy theory. The, the way that I did it sort of as elaborately as I did is um, a lot of this will serve as the blueprint for stuff that I want to say in, in a more general setting, namely VN periodic homotopy theory. And especially this Kazul duality uh, will play a really uh, fundamental role. So I'll, I'll spend all of tomorrow's lecture sort of developing this stuff a bit more. Um, Trying to explain how it how it uh, applies not only over Q but just in, in in the context of stable homotopy theory. 
Right, so now I just want to do a very quick uh, introduction to periodic homotopy theory, which I'll try to keep a bit informal, and I'll, I'll try to be precise in the third lecture. So just to indicate some of the, the, analog the analogous things that are going to happen there. So, so first of all, let me just make the, uh, the, the, the blanket assumption that everything is uh, now implicitly p-local. I'll just work one prime at a time. So everything is p-local for some uh, fixed prime p. Um, so rationalization from well, the present day perspective on homotopy theory is, is the very first or the zeroth step in a hierarchy of things that you would like to do, right? So rationalization is, is, is the bottom step or the zeroth step uh, in a, a very naturally occurring hierarchy of localizations. of homotopy theory. Right, so one way to think of it is, so step zero of this, of this localization program is, well, you want to look at the rational homotopy groups of a space, what do you do? The rational homotopy groups arise in the following way. You, you look at homotopy classes of maps from a sphere into your space, and then you have to invert some stuff, namely the action of P. Right, so you invert the action of the self map uh, P from SK to SK. Because the first problem was too hard, and so you, you make it easier, and then it suddenly turns out to be very computable. Like rational homotopy groups, we have lots of ways of doing this. But of course, um, this, this localization procedure is extremely, extremely destructive. Right? You've, you've killed all torsion, so you've lost all information about P torsion or P primary torsion P power torsion let's call it that so uh, well what do you do turn the camera to the next screen yeah um, how do you sort of detect P torsion stuff well rather than invert P, you could look at maps out of the cofiber of multiplication by P. That's sort of the orthogonal thing to do. So step one in the program would be um, you take the cofiber oh, co SK mod P, so that's a mod P more space, and you consider uh, homotopy classes, pointed homotopy classes of maps from that into a pointed space X. So these are uh, what's called the, the mod P homotopy groups of a space X. Uh, but this, I mean, this problem is, again, it's way too hard, right? This, uh, this calculation is on par with just calculating ordinary homotopy groups. It's, it's not really any easier. But again, you can invert something to make your, your life easier. So this time you invert uh, another self map this time of this this more space and this is uh, the famous Adams map um, that, uh, yeah so Haynes Miller insists that this should be called the Barrett map because apparently he's the one who who first uh, constructed it or pointed it out so you what is this anyway it's a map that I'm going to label v1 and it's a map that goes from the uh, 2p minus first suspension of this space uh, to itself. So this maybe I should remark this is for odd primes. Uh, for P is two. You have to. Uh, it's it, there's also a map like this, but it goes from the eightfold suspension of a mod two more space to itself. So it's it's a bit different, but other than that, the, the principle will be the same. So this is some uh, some very fundamental map that Adams wrote down in his work on on K theory and the J homomorphism. Um, and well, the special feature of this map is that it induces an isomorphism. So V1 induces an isomorphism uh, on topological K theory. So, in particular, uh, once you know that, you know that this is not a nilpotent self map. I mean, if this induces an isomorphism, you can compose it with itself as many times as you like, and it will still induce an isomorphism. So, it's never null. So, it's at least it's interesting to try to invert it. Um, actually, it's, I mean, it's, it does something very specific. It multiplies by the bot class. 
in K theory. So this somehow the existence of this map is some very well, it's, it's somehow it, it's a bit like a geometric incarnation of bot periodicity. Like bot periodicity really exists on this space as a map. There's a map that implements bot periodicity, which is very rare. I mean, like you shouldn't expect a general space to have that. So you can invert this. Um, so you know this 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 map V1. It's, it sort of acts on this collection of or pointed sets a priori. I mean, they also are groups for K sufficiently large. So it acts on these groups, you can invert it and get what's called the v V1 periodic homotopy groups. So inverting it, so this gives V1 periodic homotopy groups. Um, so a priori, this looks like something maybe a bit esoteric, but again, it turns out that this, this really helps, this inverting V1. Like the result is something that's very computable. Right? So this, let me just say, these are computable, and then uh, maybe I should put it in quotation marks. To, like, it's maybe it's a bit harder than rational homotopy theory, but only marginally harder. There are many computations, like well, especially Mahold uh, should be mentioned, but um, also uh, Davis and Thompson and Bousfield. Like uh, for spheres, these groups are known. For more spaces, these groups are known, and then for many things which you can build out of spheres by fibrations, like things like compact Lie groups, also. Uh, they're all, I think Davis computed the V1 periodic homotopy groups of all compact Lie groups. Um, so, yeah, anyway, there's a lot known about these groups. So, um, so that, that's sort of step one. And then, um, well, you can, you can move on. Like, what's the next thing to do? Well, what have we done? We've destroyed all V1 torsion, right? So, okay, you can move on uh, and uh, take the cofiber. Step two is to take the cofiber uh, of V1 and consider maps out of that. Uh, and well, by now you can sort of, of course, guess where this is going. Uh, this problem is too hard, but you can invert something. Uh, so there's a there's another self map. Uh, let's call it V2. Uh, and inverting it gives V2 periodic homotopy groups, et cetera, et cetera. And this turns out to be a pattern that continues indefinitely. So this pattern continues. Again, I'll, I'll be much more precise on Wednesday, but essentially the results of Hopkins-Smith, their periodicity theorem, uh, tells you that you, know, you can do this for any n. So for any n, Uh, there exist these things which look a bit like more spaces. Let's call them generalized more spaces. So these are things that you could sort of abusively denote by, you know, first I modded out by P, and then I modded out by V1, and then I kept doing this all the way up to some map that I named Vn minus uh, 1, and these have. Certain interesting self maps called VN. So these are VN self maps. Okay, so it's really just the natural continuation of this picture that I sketched to to higher n. And once you have these things in hand, uh, it makes sense to speak of the VN periodic homotopy groups of something. So you look at maps out of such a space into your given space X. This map VN will act on those those homotopy classes, and you you invert it. Okay, so this. This gives rise rise to the Vn periodic homotopy groups of spaces. All right. So now you could say, okay. I mean, uh, earlier I was talking about rational equivalences, or map is rational equivalence if it gives an iso on rational homotopy groups. Similarly, I could call a map. Uh, a VN periodic equivalence, uh, if it induces an ISO on on these periodic homotopy groups, so it's a VN periodic equivalence if it induces an ISO on these VN periodic homotopy groups. 
Okay, so now in analogy with rational homotopy theory, uh, I mean, you'd like to study the portion of homotopy theory that only sees this VN periodic stuff. You sort of you want to localize. So you want to invert these VN periodic equivalences. So, um, well, you can try to formally do that, but it's sort of, it's not actually obvious that you can in a reasonable way. So there, there's an issue which at first seems like a silly issue because it's a set theory issue, but it's not silly. So, you know, whenever you have a, a category and some class of maps, you could try to formally invert them. You get a new category, but it's not actually, it doesn't live in the same universe anymore. It might be bigger. Your HOM sets might have, might have exploded. And in practice, this is a problem. But uh, it turns out here, it doesn't explode. So that's, uh, that's Bousfield's business. So uh, he proved that the localization of S star at the VN periodic equivalences exists as as a like let's say as an infinity category you know with the same size okay so I'll, I'll denote it s sub VN uh, throughout these lectures okay so maybe uh, yeah sure question Ah, so the question is, I've, is it topological K-theory or p-adic topological K-theory? Since my space is p-torsion, uh, it doesn't matter whether I p-complete or not. There's, uh, you know, the rational part is, is so it's, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't make a difference for this particular point. I mean, but you're right that some in the setting, like the sort of the natural cohomology theory to consider with respect to V1 periodic phenomena would be p-adic K-theory, that's right, but it, here it doesn't make a difference. Um, Okay, so uh, maybe one word of warning here, because th like the name Bousfield is attached here. You might guess this is a Bousfield localization, and that's not true. So this is not one of these localizations where the localization functor has a right adjoint. It just doesn't, okay? Uh, the localization functor doesn't preserve colings. It's uh, actually, it turns out to be a composition of a left and a right localization, if you wanted to know. But uh, Anyway, um, I just want to close with one or two statements about this category. So the Essentially, the goal, or one of the things that we'll, we'll try to get to in the third lecture, is uh, is the following statement, namely that there's a description of this this VN periodic homotopy theory that is very similar to uh, what what Quillen did for the rational case. So, um, so here's the statement. So this S VN, this infinity category of VN periodic spaces, you might call it, is equivalent to that of Lie algebras in, uh, let me write it like this, spectra VN, which means the VN periodic localization of spectra. So these are, these are spectral Lie algebras. So that's, that's a notion we'll be looking at in detail uh, tomorrow, spectral Lie algebras. And, um, well, they're, they're sort of in, in VN periodic spectra. So by that, I just mean I've also taken stable homotopy theory and localized it with respect to these VN periodic equivalences. Right. Okay, so this, um, well, this looks very similar to one half of Quillen's theorem. There's the Lie model. Um, of course, the, the, the obvious question to ask here is what would happen to the other side? And we'll, we'll look at that too. It turns out to be a pretty good approximation, but it's not actually equivalent. So maybe a warning here. Uh, this Lie algebras, there, there's no sort of perfect form of Kazoo duality here. So this is not, I mean, they're related. There's an adjoint pair to commutative co-algebras, but it's not equivalent to commutative co-algebras. Okay, so these infinity categories are different. But still, in practice, the relation between the two is very important. So often, if you actually try to compute sort of the Lie algebra that belongs with a space, what you do is you first look at a, a co-algebra associated to that space, namely its suspension spectrum or some localization of its suspension spectrum. And then you somehow try to extract the Lie algebra from it by, by taking primitives of some sort. And then, well, that might or might not be the correct answer, but it's always some kind of completion of the correct answer. So it gives you a lot of information about the correct answer. So in practice, that's often how, well, attempts at calculations uh, go. You first go here, and then you try to go there, because somehow computing this directly it tends to be uh, well, passing from here to here directly tends to be sort of complicated. Um, I think my hour is
goes up, so it's probably a natural point to stop. Thomas? No, no. I d for uh, the, the question is the spaces are still simply connected. Uh, for n, at least one. So for periodic homotopy theory, it doesn't matter at all. I mean, periodic homotopy groups don't care about connectivity. I can chop off any range of homotopy groups at the bottom, and it doesn't change anything about the VN periodic homotopy type, because sort of like. VN periodic homotopy theory is completely insensitive to eilenberg maclean spaces or to Posnikov systems. So, so the, the connectivity plays no role here, either on the left or the right. There's no, there's no connectivity in periodic homotopy theory. 